Well, hello again, everybody. This is part two of the series on total, complete, awesome surrender, absolute surrender to our Lord and Master Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Last time I set the stage, I hope you will have heard part one instead of just jumping into this one. And I went into some detail in that part one. It, made, it actually led me to have to repent a lot because... Uh, you know, when I prepare these messages, I'm preaching at myself as much as anything else. And I just began to see, I, boy, I'm not fully surrendered. I'm just not. I'm just not. And I got to look at the calendar, I mean, at the camera too, <laughs> instead of always at the screen. Anyway, what's total and complete surrender? I think it was illustrated a lot by Joshua and Joshua 5. They just had that big ceremony of the circumcision and Gilgal, the hill of foreskins. In Joshua 5, and they just done the Passover. And Joshua 5, verse 13 to 15, came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes. You know, he's out there looking at the, at the walled city. It's not a very big city by our standards today. Uh, I, I've seen the ruins and, the, and, and so the, stone, the stones of Jericho. I've been there. But he saw a man standing opposite him with a sword. Now, if a man standing opposite me with a sword, whom I hadn't seen coming or something, I don't know if I'd run right up to him, but Joshua did. Joshua went right up to him. Are you for us or against us? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not for you or against you. I'm coming as your boss. I'm coming as commander of the army of Jehovah. I've now come. Yes, Joshua, Yeshua, <laughs> actually fell on his face to the earth and worshiped face on the earth, on the ground. That's what worship means. Really, when you get down, study it. Proskunio, in the, I think that's the Greek, bowing right down. And he said to him, what is my Lord, my Adon, what is Adonai, my Lord, say to his servant? What do you have to tell me? What do you want me to do? Immediate submission, immediate surrender. And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet, show little respect, for the place you stand on is holy. And Joshua did so. I showed last time how Paul had the same question. What is it my Lord would have me do in Acts chapter 9? Surrendering unconditionally is always hard. It's never easy to give up your sovereignty, your your decision-making. Now, someone else is claiming to come aboard and telling you what to do and how to do it. But we should be seeking God's lead in our life. I think this is one of the most important topics, actually. It won't be one of the more popular ones, because who wants to give up their sovereignty? God will make us go. Here's a warning. God will make you and me go through as much as he needs to in trials and hardships because in trials and hardships is when we finally do look up. Finally. We look down for a long time in depression. Finally, we look up. Finally, we go to God until we surrender unconditionally and quit relying on ourselves or our own good works or our own ideas. And we say, Lord, what, do you, what would you have me do? Do you and I go through a single day or even start a day without first praying, without some time on our knees, some time in prayer, even if it's just a short prayer, five or ten minutes. If that's a long prayer for you. Remember, Yeshua prayed all night one time before selecting the disciples. Prayer and Bible study, seeking God's word, that's the daily manna. I have a sermon on daily manna, but I'm going to give a new one. But this is how we're fed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And, and Yeshua said, I am that manna. I am the bread from heaven. And by me, you will live and be nourished and get direction for your life. It's the, it's the manual. It's the manual of how to live. And we seek him first. Seek you first the kingdom of God. We don't let God kind of slip into place someplace as we run the basis. No, God is first. First. I'm trying to learn that all the time myself, too. It's a basic, like I said last time, where Vince Lombardi would get his team together and say, gentlemen, every year, this is a football. Let's get back to basics. 
If the basics aren't sound, the whole foundation is, is unsound. The, the basic is daily prayer, daily. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit, Yeshua said. Abide in me. Psalms 1 talks, Psalm 1 talks about the man planted by the rivers of water and on his word he meditates day and night. On his word he meditates day and night. Joshua was told in Joshua 1, these aren't in my notes, God's putting them here right now. Joshua 1, and if you'll take my word, live by them, meditate on my word day and night, I will prosper your way. That has to be a habit. If we're not doing that, can I tell you all, on authority of God's word, if we're not seeking and obeying him, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we haven't surrendered. We haven't understood the need for that yet enough. So true surrender starts with brokenness of your heart and spirit, like that horse that has to be broken and becomes one with the rider at some point, humbled and yet still spirited. It's okay, it's okay to have spirit, but not pride, not pride. In that brokenness, we turn around, we go God's way. Broken hearts and sad hearts and broken and, and, and being sorry, feeling sorry, that's not enough for repentance. We have to turn around, go the other way. So anyway, but only a broken horse is safe to ride. And we must, we must be like that horse in a sense. I'm not calling us horses but just something we can understand that we have to give up the self until we can be picking up on Yeshua's imperceptible guidance, direction, leadership, words. We're hearing him just like that rider, can only, a good rider-horse combination. The rider doesn't have to bang the horse over the head. The rider doesn't have to, uh, you know, you don't see him making big motions. So I talked about all that in part one. We must become one. And in part one also I talked about how we must proclaim him as our king, as our Lord. Every tongue shall proclaim Jesus as Lord. A time is coming in Philippians 2. It says that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Make sure you're doing it now. I read last time uh, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that we have to, with our hearts and our mouths, confess him. Confess him. I read that last time. We Sabbath-keeping groups rarely read that, that passage. We don't even use the word Lord or Lord Jesus much. And that, that's silly. That's just silly. It's wrong. We must confess him out Lord, as Lord out loud. I'm recommending, and I did last time, in your daily prayer, that you say, Lord Jesus, Lord Yeshua, I want you as my Lord. I want you as my commander. I surrender to you. I give up my heart. I give up my will. I look to your will, your desires. Guide me, lead me. And there's so much more in part one. I hope you'll take the time to hear it. We have to become more and more like Yeshua. Remember what Yeshua told the, told the uh, Jews back in John 8, 38, I think it is. He says to them, the works you see me do, that's not me. Those are my father's works. The words you hear me say, that's not me. Those are my father's words. I'm not speaking my own words. I'm not doing my own thing. Everything I do, Yeshua said, is to please the Father, to seek his will. And in fact, he goes on to say in Matthew 7, 21, those who will be in the kingdom of God, our Lord says, will be those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. Matthew 7, 21. And those and only those whom Jesus will call his brothers and sisters, his siblings. Again, the people came up and your brothers and sisters are here looking for you in Matthew 12, verse 48, 49. And he said, who are my brothers and sisters? And he looks at the crowd and he says, um, they are the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. Those and only those are the ones that even calls his siblings, the ones doing the will. So let's pray, Father in heaven, I just ask you now to look down from heaven and just pour your Holy Spirit on those hearing this sermon whenever they hear it. Let them see. Let them feel. They have to surrender. I have to surrender. Pour your anointing on me and on those who are listening and on all of us that will learn from each other, mostly from you. And I just pray that we really will learn what it means to totally and unconditionally surrender to you, dear Lord. We bow our heads. We love you. 
We submit to you. We want to obey you. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. So, welcome again. And to Light on the Rock, I am Philip Shields, the host, the, the host not the Lord, <laughs> the, the host and founder of this website. It's a free website. We don't charge anything. Remember to check out everything on there. I'm putting in new audios, new videos. We'll repost some of the old audios if they're real good and uh, timeless. But we'll be looking for new blogs. The blogs are short articles on a host of topics. Everything from should a woman wear a veil in church, uh, should you have tattoos, um, everything. Is, is, you'll, you'll find topics galore, hundreds and hundreds of blogs. Just type in a search box topic and you'll see there's just so much there. Have you had your one-on-one -on -one with the Lord? Have you? It's coming if you haven't already. My Lord and my God, as Thomas said, when he finally met Yeshua after the resurrection, and Yeshua says, put your hand in my Put your fingers in my hand here. It probably, it probably went to the wrist where the, where the spike actually went because the wrist to the hand was called the hand. And then he says, stick your hand up my side. And that was his alone moment, one-on-one -on -one moment. My Lord and my God. Paul, when he was knocked down off his high horse by that light and the voice of Yeshua. And then finally, when he realizes this is a big momentous event, he said, Lord, Master, King, Leader, Boss, what do you want me to do? You know what? That's not even in the modern translations. That phrase is so bad that they, that they miss that. But New King James and King James and the, and the Young's Literal Translation, um, those all have it. Another good example was Yeshua, Joshua, as I, as I mentioned earlier. What does my Lord say to his servant? So do you, do you hear the similarities of total surrender? Not my will, but yours be done. I, what do you want me to do? We should be asking that question. I should be. You should be. Every single day. When we wake up in the morning and we kneel beside our bed or head on the carpet, I try, try to do that as well. Because that's what true worship is, is head on the ground. It's a worshipful heart as well, of course. But if we're well surrendered, we will be saying, Father in heaven, Yeshua, my Lord, what do you want me to do today? Show me, please talk to me. If we're really surrendered, here's the big thing I want to tell you all. Too many of us, I've done it. You're doing it. It's a wrong understanding here. Too many of us make our own plans, hope for what we want, Let's say you're buying a house, getting a new job, uh, enrolling your kids in a high, in a high school or, or university or whatever, once the COVID Wuhan virus is gone. What I want to say to you is, what we do is we, we say, Father, um, I'm thinking of marrying so-and-so. Can you bless that? Can you make that happen? She's so beautiful. Can you make that happen? What's wrong with that? It's not seeking His will. You can say, Father, I really love so-and-so. I, I, I want to marry her. If that's your will, please let it happen. If it's not your will, please open my heart and mind to see it. Submit to you. Show me who you want me to marry. Or if you don't want me to marry, not marry at all. Whether it's buying a house, getting married, or any of those things. But when we uh, live our own life and trying to ask, ask God's blessing on what we want, it's all backwards. Ask him to reveal his will, his desire for you. It'll be a lot better than yours in the first place. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? And all through each day, you know, when I make calls, when I was working, I've kind of retired now in a way, but when I was working, before each call that, and I'd start to talk to somebody, I would just ask God, or before even calling a, a series of calls, I would just say, please let me have your mind, your spirit, and if I can, let me even testify of you. Today And I, I often did, several times a day. Uh, we talk about healing or we talk about faith and uh, total strangers on the phone. And, and God would open those doors sometimes. So for the Son of God to be your and your Lord involves total and complete surrender. Unconditional, complete surrender or he's not your Lord yet. So... Last time we talked about total brokenness and surrender. Number one, we talked about openly speak and live. Acknowledgement that Yeshua is your Lord. Call him your Lord. Testify to that every day when you speak 
in him, to him in prayer. And let's move on to other points now. Number three, we surrender our do-it-yourself lives of trying to be righteous by hard work on our own part. We surrender our do-it-yourself righteousness, our do-it-yourself life, to acknowledging we need our Lord. We need Yeshua, that we're under grace. So now as we pray, we say, Father in heaven, and Yeshua, my Savior, my Lord, I acknowledge and receive your grace. I acknowledge I can't do it without it. I acknowledge I can't be righteous without it. I acknowledge I'll never be perfect on my own actions and efforts. I come under your grace, which you provided as a covering for me. Thank you so much for it. Complete surrender means even... A lot of you are having a hard time with this because you don't want to give up complete surrender. A lot of you think somehow you work hard enough, you'll be like Christ and be perfect someday. You'll be, you shall therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. I'll give a whole sermon on that coming up soon, how that happens. But unless we're under the grace of God, we're not under true repentance. It's such a difficult point for those of you who find it hard to give up yourself. They try to do it themselves. They end up unhappy. You end up unhappy. You end up feeling like such a failure. You yourself end up without the joy of salvation because you flub up like Paul did, like I do, like all of us do. And because you think I'm flubbing up, you're flubbing up, God must be really furious with me because I'm a sinner now. We keep falling short of the mark. We keep stumbling, we keep stumbling unintentionally, but we just can't do it ourselves perfectly, and you know it. I have a friend out west who thinks he's going to someday get there perfectly on his own. Oh, he'll say with the Holy Spirit. Paul had the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I can't do it perfectly. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me? End of Romans 7. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Then chapter 8, verse 1, there were no chapters back then. There's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not work, uh, who do not walk after the flesh, but uh, according to the Spirit. That part's also missed out of the new, newer translations, the, the last phrase there. I've given many, many sermons on God's righteousness being offered to us, given to us. It's a gift of salvation. We don't earn salvation. We receive it by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast though we're called to do good works, but not for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talk about you've been saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then verse 10 says, but you've been also called to do some good works. You're created in the works that Christ is, 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 is providing for you to do. <clears throat> so I've given many, many sermons on righteousness. Just look up God's righteousness in, in the search bar. Lots of sermons on it. And I'll give sermons coming up on that concept of being perfect. Being perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You have not surrendered your life if you think you're going to be righteous by struggling really hard in your unhappy state of failure because that's the way you're going to end up as you know it. Philippians 3, sometimes you guys go back and read it again, verses 8 to 11. I don't want my righteousness which is from the law but that which is by faith, that that which is from God, his righteousness, by faith, through Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. Many of you resist this to your hurt, and, and you're going through lack of joy of knowing your salvation, knowing your Savior. Surrender starts with repentance, but it also starts with accepting God's grace for you, or else you haven't surrendered. You're still doing it on your own. Good luck. Good luck. When you're ready to talk about it, give me a call. We'll talk at length. Listen to my sermons on God's righteousness. Mm. And be looking for the sermon I, I will have on uh, you shall therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Number four. So number three is if you're really surrendering, you're going to, number one was brokenness. Number two is proclaim him. Acknowledge him as your Lord. Over and over in prayer and talk with other people. Talk about the Lord Yeshua. Talk about the Lord Jesus. And to truly surrender, number four now, we need God's Spirit. 
Again, that's part of acknowledging we can't do it on our own. Without God's Spirit, we're not even considered His children. Pentecost is the anniversary when God sent the Holy Spirit to a bunch of people in Acts 2, verses 1 to 4, and then being able to fight sin and making us begotten children of God because that's the seed of God inside of us. It begets us into His family. Romans 8, verses 6 to 10 out of the Holman translation. Romans 8, verses 6 to 10. The mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh, the carnal nature, is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law and is unable to do so. Those whose lives are in the flesh, if you're in the flesh, cannot please God. Are you in the flesh? If you are, you cannot please God. Verse 9, you, however, are not, not in the flesh. He's not talking about having flesh and blood. He's talking about a nature that we have, a fleshly nature. If we're in the flesh, we cannot please God and cannot even obey Him. But verse 9 says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. And if you don't have His Spirit... Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So you see why we need to have it. So that we can be truly surrendered and part of His team, part of His family. We need to have the Holy Spirit. And also so we can please Him. Uh, so, so if we are in the Spirit, which we are in the Spirit, that means we can please God. Verse 13 goes on to say that we put to death the deeds of the body by God's Spirit. So we grow to the point that we, like Paul in Romans 7, he says, yeah, I still do things I don't like. The thing which I hate, that I do, he says twice, maybe even three times. I think it's twice in Romans 7. Referring to his spiritual stumbles and all of that later on. My point is, he at least got to the point where he could say, I hate sin. I hate the pull of my flesh that I still have. I, I'm in the spirit, but I still have the fleshly nature inside, battling each other, like Galatians 5 says. Until we're changed to spirit and this corruptible corruption puts on incorruption, puts on perfection, that, will, that battle will go on depending on who we listen to, who we feed, and who we listen to, okay? So number four, we need God's spirit. Number five, we no longer live life like, like we're still a part of Satan's kingdom. If you're really surrendered... You don't go back and forth between Satan's kingdom and your king and God's kingdom. We don't just we don't we just don't do that. We come out of Satan's world, though we live in it. We come out of it. We live in the new kingdom way. I'm going to challenge you on this because this is where also I had to find myself repenting as well. I have God's spirit. Uh, point number four. I come to brokenness. And point number one. I've acknowledged in point number two. And all the things that we're saying here. Point number four, we need God's spirit. Number five, we no longer live like we're still a part of Satan's kingdom. John 8, 44, Yeshua says to the Jews who believed him, who believed him, you are of your father, the devil. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They hadn't received that or anything like that. They were fighting him. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires, the will of your father you want to do. But you and I were bought back. We were redeemed by our Goel, our Redeemer, when Messiah gave his life for you as a ransom and put you into his kingdom, at least the starting point of it, awaiting its full reality, of course, when the Messiah returns. I give several scriptures to talk about how we're bought back. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1, verses 12 to 14, giving thanks to the Father. Listen to this. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Who has qualified us. He has delivered, past tense, us from the power of darkness and conveyed, past tense, translated, I think it says in King James, he has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. 
So you have the kingdom of God, but Yeshua said, the Father has conveyed upon me a kingdom, bequeathed to me a kingdom, given me a kingdom, and I will in turn give you uh, positions in that kingdom as well, he said. And so he says that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're not part of Satan's kingdom anymore. We're in his world. We're going to beat him on his own turf, though, through Christ. Okay? Our home is kingdom of heaven. We're playing away in, in Satan's kingdom. We're going to win this game, this war. Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people, that you don't partake in her terrible sins that I'm going to be sending, uh, I mean, uh, terrible uh, plagues that I'm going to be sending on to Babylon. God warns us in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18, Come out from among them and be separate. I will be a father to you. Let's post this up here, these, this one here. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Be separate. Doesn't mean we can't have friends with our neighbors. Doesn't mean I can't go have dinner with my neighbor or someone from work. It just means don't be part of what evil is going on. Don't celebrate their pagan holidays. Don't do evil things that they're doing. So we're not part of the society of the values or its ways. We're simply not. We don't have to talk like them. We don't have to have our uncombed hair like them. We don't have to dress like them. You know, Boris Johnson, the prime minister of England, I don't know how much he pays for that hairstyle. To me, it looks like someone has just woken up out of bed, not touched their head at all. And so be it. Teach one his own, I guess. But we don't have to. If that's the modern style, why do we have to go there? We don't have to buy jeans with holes in the knees and try to look like people of the world. We just don't. We certainly don't have to put tattoos. God says, don't make marks on your body. Don't cut your, into your skin. Don't do it. We don't have to have tattoos. Ladies, when I see a woman walking towards me with a dark tattoo on her thigh or who knows where else, and as she comes towards me, I'm thinking, boy, she's got an awful bruise. Until I realize that's not an awful bruise, that's a tattoo. But why would, they, why would you do that? Anyway, come out from among them. We're not part of that. Full surrender means like Rahab of Jericho says, your God's going to be my God. I'm going to switch over. I'm, going to, I'm not going to follow the gods of Jericho. I want your God. I want your people. Ruth did the same thing. They switched from being a part of the enemy to being part of his team, part of his family. So though we belong to Messiah now, guess what? We still have these two natures inside of us. Like Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17 says. And they'll, they'll both be there until the resurrection. God's talking to us and Satan's talking to us. Which one are we listening to? Which one are we going to follow? Which, which one are we going to feed? By feed, I mean, what kind of movies are you going to watch? The kind that feed the good nature of God or the kind that feed Satan's nature? My wife and I simply won't watch a movie that has F words and nudity and all of that. We just won't do it. Am I tempted as a man to see an action film that has a little bit of flesh and action? Of course I am. That's where the war comes in. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And that's where we call out to God for strength. And that's where we go into the scriptures, combat every temptation, turn the TV off, change the channel. Galatians 5, 16, 17, Holman Bible, I say to you then, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's against the Spirit. And the Spirit desires what's against the flesh. There's this war. They're opposed to each other so you don't do what you end up not doing what you want. That is if we listen to the flesh. Paul called the old nature of the old man inside us several times. The carnal nature of the flesh. Still at work. So have you come out of Satan's world? Have you? What do you watch on TV? You who would never let a foul mouth, swearing, knife wielding, pistol shooting, violent man or woman into your home, using bad words and profanity, why do we let them in by TV? Why do we let them in to our home by TV? I speak to myself, sometimes I've done that. That's got to stop. It's got to stop if we're really fully surrendered. Watching TV shows that include things that are demonic. 
Why are some of you still walking, uh, watching movies about The Walking Dead and demons and Harry Potter and his witches and mediums who can talk to the dead? Shows about ghosts and everything God says he abhors and hates and his children we should be like our father. Why are you dabbling in the world of Satan's demons? It's wrong, wrong, wrong. You're playing with fire, period. Stop it. I have several sermons about demons. Just look up demons uh, in the search bar. They'll pop up. I think I have three in there. We must not let them entertain us or talk to us. And they'll talk to you by these kinds of mediums, the TV, movies, and so on. Don't watch them. Watching TV or videos of murder, of violence, nudity, topless girls. Okay, it's not out and out hard porn, maybe. And we kind of, oh, come on, it's just art. I've had some of you say, it's just art. If a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. And was one guy was saying, but I don't lust. Well, then you must not have any red blood in you. That's not our kingdom of God way. It's Satan's kingdom's way. And you are deceiving yourself if you think you can watch all that and be pleasing to God Almighty. Would Jesus Christ, would Yeshua, sit down beside you and watch nudity, toplessness and all this, and violence, and mayhem, and lying, and drug, drug addiction, and drug, drug deals, and all this, Whatever it is you're watching that you know isn't the kingdom of God way. That's not being fully surrendered. And you know Yeshua wouldn't be sitting there beside you. Stop it. Stop it. Fight it. Appeals to the flesh. But if you go to Las Vegas or Reno, you and I aren't going places where all this is depicted and, and shown. Where you, you, you know good well Yeshua wouldn't be going to the same show with you. And that's just plain stupid, frankly, to be playing with that kind of fire. When we go face to face and it's wars without our spiritual armor on, without praying and studying, and we're feeding the flesh, that's just stupid. Where do you spend most of your working time, non-working time? TV? Videos? Games? Instagram? Facebook? Where? and you have no time to study God's word. Politics. Many of us, many of you, got upset with the elections here in America. I did too. I was hoping God would hear our prayers. But the candidate who lost was far from being a godly man, let's, let's admit it. We are sojourners like Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and Jacob traveling through this life, traveling through this world. We're sojourners. We're not committed to the elephant party or the donkey party. We're committed to the party of the lambs, the lamb of God. We're the sheep of his pasture. So I still fight for the press. I still hope for the best for the people being butchered by abortion. So I do support the party that does their best to stop abortions, give people a choice. I mean, not a choice, but, but stop the choice of killing babies. That's for sure. So many people who are great people today, famous people today, I mentioned this in a previous sermon, uh, could have been aborted, very easily aborted. So anyway, don't get so engrossed in the politics that we forget that we are sojourners and we end up not giving God the time he deserves. Uh, come, come out of Satan's world. Come out of Satan's world. You're not part of that world. Don't participate in it. Don't pretend that you're a Christian and a believer. Don't pretend that you've surrendered, but you're still being part of Satan's ways. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Wake up, folks. Repent of this Laodiceanism. I'm okay kind of attitude. Number six, total surrender to Christ's lordship means we bring every thought all day long into total surrender and captivity of obedience to Christ. Let's read that, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point because I'm going to give a whole sermon on it soon. I read a book by Jenny Allen, J-E-N-N-I-E -N -N -E Allen, 
called uh, Get Out of Your Head. I just thought it was a fantastic book about this very point, about controlling our thoughts. It's what, mostly what the book is about. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. We have mighty weapons if we'll get up and use them, put them on. Casting, verse 5, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Here it is, bringing every thought, every single one, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we get a thought to do something hateful. We recognize that thought. We have a choice, as Jenny says. We have a choice. Who are we going to listen to? Every time Yeshua had a thought put there by Satan, throw yourself off this parapet. The angels will catch you. You've fasted for 40 days. You must be hungry. How about turning this bread to stone? If you're a son of God, you can do it. And Yeshua, every time, came back with the word of God. He made the choice. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. If you'll just bow down and worship me. Hey, Satan, get behind me. You're supposed to worship God and him only shall you serve. How dare you ask me to bow down before you? You're going to bow down before me, snake, <laughs> you know. So whatever it is, we have to get the uh, thoughts in line with God's spirit. You're, so some of the thoughts we might have, for example, you're, 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 you're being told your loved one has cancer, your wife, your children, and it's stage four, which means it's really progressed, meaning survival is not highly likely. Some survive stage four. What are your thoughts right now? Bring them into captivity, that I don't need to fear, that I have a healing God, that I belong to him, my children belong to him, and whatever God desires is what's best all the way up to and including, yes, you heard me, death. And so we have that peace. Or you're feeling sexually motivated. What are your thoughts right now when you feel like that? You can choose which voices to listen to, which spirit you'll listen to. You can choose to quote scripture right back, flee fornication. You can choose to read Proverbs 5 and 7 about that. And you can avoid pouring gasoline onto that fire by controlling what you watch. So you're not pouring gasoline. Hey, I'm a man. I have the same temptations as all of you men do and many of you women do. Yeah, I enjoy looking at scantily clad women in certain shows. Gotta stop, gotta stop. It's not of God. It's not of God. And we have to get to the point where we say, I hate that because that's not of God. You might still stumble in that, but I hope you feel bad and you hate it, like Paul, and stop it. And ladies, we need your help, frankly. It doesn't help much if, uh, for us to keep our minds in check if you women of God come out in low-cut you know, low tops, and then you bend over in front of us and we see everything. That does, that's not very helpful. Or short skirts, tight skirts. Come on, ladies, help us out. Especially if we're talking to, you know, if we're talking about being around teenage boys, young men especially, but even us old guys. I mean, come on, help us out. If you go to the beach, what are you going to wear? Help us out. I need a whole sermon just on this point of capturing our thoughts and bringing them to captivity. So bringing every thought to captivity to the obedience of Christ. Again, the book I'd recommend it. Uh, get out of your head. Be, make sure you don't get the study guide to it, but get the book. Or you can get the book and the study guide. And um, capture your thoughts. Bring them to Christ. You have that choice. Yeshua's example. I gave you about how he acted to every one of Satan's temptations. Number seven. One fully surrendered, fully trusts. Fully trusts. Fully trusts his Lord in everything and for everything, during everything and anything going on in his or her life. Everything. You trust God. Everything, anything, no exceptions. If that's not the case, if you're a worrywart, you haven't surrendered. You haven't understood what it means that you are not your own. You have been bought. You belong to somebody else. If I go to the store and I buy a plant or I buy a tool, I can do whatever I want with that plant. I can do whatever I want with that tool. 
God has bought me. I belong to him. He's a good owner. He's a good master. And so I've got to come to where I will trust him. And he's going to test me and he's going to test you over and over and over again if you trust him. We live by faith. We live by trust. That's what I'm trying to say. So when I get the bad news, what I'm trying to do, I preached on it. I'm trying to do it. I've done it successfully many times and sometimes I don't. I like the way I feel when I do it successfully. The last time I was told I had cancer was about five years ago, lymphoma. And the, the test results showed that. They wanted to do more tests and more studies and so on. They even thought I, I had a uh, brain tumor. And so I had, you know, the, the, that all examined. What do you call that thing? You go into this big tube like a coffin. Um, it escapes me right now. You know, it makes a lot of noise and racket. You're not supposed to move. A lot of fun. Anyway, I had all the tests and I come back. But this time, I was thanking God for it and in it. It's a time I can glorify you. And if I have it, I have it. If I die, I die. I'm yours. Whether I live or whether I die, it's yours. See, you know the scriptures. They come to your mind in times like that. Paul said that. To live is gain, to die is, is, is to be with Christ. It's okay. Either way. I live or die. I live for Christ. And then I went in to have it, you know, the further test results. And the, uh, when I got this call from the, what was it, the um, Florida Cancer Institute, confirming your appointment. I said, cancer? I thought I had lymphoma. Well, <laughs> shows you how much I knew. But anyway, so I looked up lymphoma. Okay, I'm not going to let it scare me. It's okay. I'm in God's hands. If I die, I die. If I live, I live. And the lady says, I don't know what happened to all your, those things in the last test, but there's nothing here now. Nothing. There's nothing in your head and there's no tumor. I said, what do you mean nothing in my head? My, <laughs> there's something in my head, but not a tumor. And then, and then she says, yeah, the, the lymphoma tests are all fine. I also had enlarged spleen, enlarged liver, enlarged heart. All of that was enlarged, liver. All of that was enlarged. They were fine. I think I have slightly enlarged heart still, but they were fine. So if you learn to apply what God tells us, in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 and 8, where he says, where Paul says, you know, let your requests be made known to God. Let them be made known with thanksgiving. That's the antidote. That's the secret formula. That's the secret juice. Thanksgiving in all things, for all things. Ephesians 5, 20, you thank God for all things. I've given sermons on that. People come up, you mean I'm supposed to thank God for my diabetes? I'm supposed to thank God for my my incontinence, I'm, I'm supposed to, you know, various ones. Yes. All things means that too. Yes. In it, for it. All I know is that when I do that, the chances of my healing happening are wonderful. And if, if I'm not healed, that's God too. I, I, I belong to him. I belong to him. So you don't worry. Jesus said that. Don't worry. Uh, where was that? Matthew 6. Verses 25 to 34, I'd like to ask you to read that. He says, why do you worry? I tell you, do not worry. That's what unbelievers, that's what Gentiles do. Gentiles, he meant spiritually. There's too much worrying going on. Worrying means you're not submitted in part of your life to God. Worrying means you've forgotten that you don't belong to yourself. Here are my sermons I've given on being praising God and thanking Him in and for all things. Just put in for all things and it'll show up. I have another one on when I'm weak, I'm strong. When I am weak, I am strong. Uh, those go into this very topic very deeply. It's normal to worry, to be fearful at first. But then we have to control the thoughts, bring them to captivity to Jesus Christ. Fully surrender means I'm surrendered to what you want, Yeshua. Psalm 56. Verse 3 and 4, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise, praise his word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear. When I'm afraid, I'm going to trust you. And I'll add, I will thank you, and then I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Romans 14, verses 7 and 8, worry and fear, I'm going to say it again, means you don't understand you are not your own. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. you are not your own. Romans 14, verses 7 and 8. 
For none of us lives to himself. No one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Paul, who had been beaten many times with rods in chains much of his life, it seems like, shipwrecked, bitten by snakes, hounded by Jews, stoned and left for dead, whipped multiple times in robberies and all kinds of things, God tested and tested and tested Paul. You would think God would protect him from all those things. He went through a whole lot, yet he learned to be content in whatsoever state I am in, as he says in Philippians 4. So a fully surrendered person can thank God in all things, no matter what's going on. Whatever can happen to you, God can handle it. He's got this. He's got this. My brother, my brother wears this, uh, this uh, what do you call them, a rubber band. Kind of, it looks like, it's not a rubber band, but it's a wrist thing. And it says, God's got this. Yeah, we have it in Spanish, we have it in English. If you'd like some, let me know. And I'll try to get some for you. God's got this. My brother wears it. My brother's been through two strokes, a heart attack, surgeries galore. Um, he's in tremendous pain at times on his left side. And he's paralyzed on his right. God's got this. I belong to God. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to get upset. Okay? So we're trying to live it. That's what I'm saying, my brother and I. Point number eight. Full surrender means accepting and obeying all of God's commands. All of them. By and in Christ, you can do all things, including the hard ones. Paul's conversion is, what do you want me to do? And we're, we're, we're told to live, live by every word of God. Every word of God. I urge you to start writing down that phrase, what do you want me to do? What would you have me do, Lord? And then start to obey. You can call him Lord, Lord, he can answer your prayers, he can help you preach sermons, but if you don't obey him, he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I've never known you. That's in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. The hard commands, for example, I'll give you a few examples. Love your enemy. My next sermon will be probably an audio on loving your enemy. How do you love your enemy? What does that mean? Yeshua says, you don't even identify as a child of God if you don't. He says, love those who love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you, despitefully use you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, because he causes rain to come on the just and the unjust. Tithing, that's a tough one to obey. Be generous with your money. If you don't believe in tithing, at least be generous with your money. And uh, those who preach the word should not have to survive by the word. Uh, any of you who have contributed to this, I don't take personal money out of it. We use it for promoting this. We use it to support uh, orphanages. We, we, uh, an orphanage in uh, Kenya uh, with 30, 30 orphans. We use it to support uh, uh, old ladies who, who um, have had strokes, and still trying to work, and they can't. The command to love your wife, even if she's unlovable at times. Love her as Christ loves the church. We're not always obedient to Christ. We don't always fall in line to everything he says. He loves us anyway. Wives, submit to your husbands. Love them and submit to them. That's really hard. But the head of the wife is the husband. The head of the husband is the Christ. And the head of Christ is God. That's in Corinthians. Who preaches that anymore? Who even dares to preach it and tell women you have to submit to your husbands? And we husbands have to submit also to our wives. It says, where it says, wives, submit to your husband. I think it's before that. It says, submit to one another. So I'm trying to grow in this area. And I'll come to my wife and I'll say, what can I do for you today? Or I'll bring her a cup of coffee. Is there anything else you'd like me to bring you? And I, I help clean up the kitchen, sweep the floors. I'll help where I can. I'm trying to be more helpful and not demanding. I've been a horrible, horrible husband at times in so many ways. And I'm trying to surrender to God. And let him change me. It must be hard for her to submit to me sometimes, but she too works on that. I know she does. We've been married for 46 years this year. 
rejoicing in trials, thanking God in all things, for all things. No more fretting, no more worrying. The key is to understand that the things you worry and fret about, it's not your concern anymore. It's God's concern. And if we quit worrying, here's the, here's the paradox. If you quit worrying and start thanking God in and for all things, he says at the end of Matthew 6, that he'll provide all the things we need in abundance. He wants us to have the abundant life. When we worry, we take control back. It won't work. You're hurting yourself. You're keeping blessings away that he wants you to have. That's a hard command. But I'm just saying, as you read the Bible, and you say, ooh, that's hard to do, do it. When you sit at God's table for spiritual food, you can't pick and choose. I'll do this, but I won't do that. Love your enemies? Come on. Make peace with someone who is insulting to me? Eat with someone who is mean to me? Come on, I'm not going to do that. Bless those who curse me? What are you thinking of? Yeshua said, do it. Do it. None of us totally are there yet, but that should be our heart's desire to totally obey him. We know that God rewards those who submit to him and obey him and become part of his kingdom. Certainly in the life to come, you will be, you'll be sobbing and weeping and gnashing of teeth if you don't be there at the very end because you refuse to surrender. We have to surrender, including the grace of God, accepting that as part of the surrender, the grace of God, the need for the Holy Spirit, all of the things we talked about, blessing, the, doing the hard commands, all of these things. The time is coming, we'll hear the voice of the archangel, the shout of the archangel, we'll hear the trumpets of God, the last trumpet. I don't know if we'll hear the first six or so before that. But then, okay, that's number five, that's number six, and the next one we hear, whoa, my body's changing. But before that, all the dead in Christ, whom we have loved and known and heard about, they're being raised up first. And then we're changed to spirit, and angels are zooming down to pick us up. I don't mean by zoom. <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean they zoom down, they pick you up. And you say, be careful, I hate heights. That's okay, you're spirit now, you'll get used to it. Boom, we're right there beside Jesus Christ and all the others. <sighs> Can't wait for that day. New body, healed, wonderful, fully. Then we get to meet God the Father, get to have the wedding supper, and then come down after the wedding supper, which I believe is around Pentecost. That's when God married Israel. There's always a fourth taste there. That's when Ruth and Boaz got married. It's right around Pentecost. They pictured Christ in the church. And it... The wedding supper is for the first fruits. Makes no sense to have the wedding done in the fall, which doesn't picture the first fruits. I'll talk about that coming up too. I gotta end this now, but I just love this part that if we surrender, in a small way, Japan tasted that when they surrendered to America. We didn't enslave them all. We didn't kill them all. We didn't punish them all. We didn't rob them all. No, we built them back. We showed them love and respect. And we did that to Germany, too, frankly. And now I say, believe. God will make that, those examples look tiny, puny, compared to what he will do, even now in this life. If you will learn to surrender, if I learn that, pray for me, too. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, help us learn to surrender to you and Yeshua, our King. Oh, God, it's so hard for us to give up our give up our what? Our flesh, which is so weak anyway. Why do we want to keep on holding on to that? Why do we want to be part of this world at any time? Please open our eyes and our ears and our mind to see, our heart, that you're calling us out of Satan's world into yours. Help me see it. Help me change. Help me surrender. Help all of those listening surrender and change and come to you surrendered and inviting you into their life, inviting you to take over, inviting you to work out every trial and problem that's your problem. And you're the God who loves problems and you make them go away quickly if you want to or let them go on, but you're there with us all the time. Oh, Father, we love you. 
We love you, Yeshua. We thank you. We praise you. Please now do put your guardian angels around our people. There's a pandemic going around. Please now, Father, give us strength to obey you no matter what. Help us be thankful to you no matter what. Help us surrender to our Lord, to our Savior, Yeshua, our Master, and to you, Great Father, King over all. You are the Lord and the God of the highest. We love you. We love you so much. We love you too, Yeshua, so much. We say all this in and through by the Holy Spirit. In Yeshua's name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.